Good morning, Cornerstone family. We are so glad you're joining us for Church Online. Whether you're tuning in from out of town, in the car, or from your home in the Kansas City area, we're so glad you're joining us in worship. Thank you for bringing the Church Online. I'm excited to share a few announcements with you this morning. We have several ways for you to connect with Cornerstone in the new year. There are two new classes starting at the end of this month. Cornerstone Basics will be going through the Gospel and Life Study by Tim Keller. We also have Leadership Explored, a class for those who want to become a better leader. This class is a prerequisite for those who want to become an elder or a deacon. And lastly, on February 25th, you have an opportunity to learn more about Cornerstone at our membership class called Discover Cornerstone. More details about these events can be found on our website, www.cornerstoneks.org. Make it a goal to grow in your faith and deepen your Cornerstone community this new year. For our January mission focus, we're going to be stocking the shelves at New Hope Food Pantry. Grab a bag in the lobby with a list of needed items and bring the filled bag back anytime this month. Thank you for helping us stock the shelves at New Hope after a busy holiday season. And it's time to start reading the next book for Cornerstone Classics. On Monday, February 12th, they'll be discussing the book Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. So grab it online or at a local library and join us for discussion on February 12th. Sign up online at cornerstoneks.org classics. As always, these announcements and other resources can be found by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here at Cornerstone. Good morning, church. Join me this morning for our call to worship out of Mark 8. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Some say you are John the Baptist and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? You are the Messiah promised from long ago before whom every knee will bow and tongue confess that you are Lord. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning.
for our confession of sin this morning, we're going to use the Heidelberg Catechism. The catechisms were used by families to teach their children the ways of God's word. And so they would ask the question and the children would respond with the answers. And the families would memorize these things together. And it was a way of teaching them God's word to sit in their hearts and in their souls all the days of their life. So we're going to read the question today together. How are you right with God? Only by truth, faith in Jesus Christ. Even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned nor been a sinner as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. And hear this assurance of pardon from John chapter 3. It's the famous verse of the Bible. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Oh, there's the great news of the gospel. The beauty of what God would do for us in Christ. May that give you hope this morning as we gather in worship to praise God for his love and mercy toward us. Well, let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that this is a day that you have made for us, a day for us to remember you, a day out of seven that you've said is your day, a holy day that we are to make holy so that we would hear the beauty of your grace and mercy. And so we thank you that as we gather today, as we hear your word before us, we know that you're doing a work in us. You're teaching us. You're correcting us. You're transforming us. You're shaping us and molding us. You're, we're learning how to walk according to your ways and not our own ways. And Lord, so we thank you. We thank you for this day that you've given. And we thank you for the beauty of your grace that has been given to us in your son. Oh, truly, he has been the one who has set us all right with you. For he took our place and died on the cross. He took all of our sin and nailed it there once and for all, never to count against us ever again. So we thank you that you would do that work, that you would love us so much that you would send him to do that for us. So teach us, Lord, to not hold on to our own self-righteousness, but to understand that we need a righteousness from another. We need your son's righteousness for us. So we thank you that when he did die, he took our sin, but then he also gave us his righteousness. So that when you do look at us, it's as if we have never sinned. It's as if we have been obedient all the time because of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. So Father, would you remind us of these things? Would you give us hope and encouragement today? When we struggle with the worries and concerns of this world, when our marriages might have struggles within them, when our relationships with our loved ones or maybe our children or maybe some family members, all of these things we're reminded of the brokenness of this world. They cause us tears and sorrow, but we thank you that you're able to work in the midst of those things. That because Christ is at work in us, you are shaping us to be more and more like your son filling us with your joy and your love and your peace and your gentleness and your loving kindness. And all of these things then overflow out of our lives into the lives of the people within our lives. And so we pray that Christ in us would be seen in others, that our love for you would be seen in the way we love people. So, Father, these are the things we want to hear today. These are the things that we need today. Father, we need Christ. And would you help us make him the center of our lives? When we so easily make our work or the things we do, the entertainments we enjoy, the the loves of this world so easily replace you, would you remind us today that that's not the way for us to live, but instead to make you the center of our lives, that you would be the preoccupation of our hearts, attention. 
So Father, work in us by the power of your spirit to do that work in us today. And by the power of your spirit, would you remind us of your presence being here with us and the beauty of your gift of Jesus Christ for us. May you do that work in us as we pray, as your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So over the next several weeks, we're going to take a look at several of the different encounters people had with Jesus. See, the Gospels were written with that kind of intent to show you how people interacted with Jesus, and we begin to see their responses, the different ways that they approached him, the different ways they looked at him, the different ways they responded to him. But each Gospel writer wrote the Gospel to tell you about Jesus and the implications of who he is and what you must do to believe in him. So they told it through stories. And so this morning, we're going to begin by taking a look and seeing the different people, male, female, Gentiles or Jews, insiders, outsiders, rich or poor. All of these different types of people had encounters with Jesus and came with different expectations, different understandings of who he was and what they wanted from him and what they needed of him and how they reacted, we're going to look at. But more importantly, I want to ask you this question. How do you respond to Jesus? How do you approach him? Why are you even here this morning? As we sit here together as a people that belong to God and we outwardly say that we have put our faith and trust in Jesus, so how do you respond to him? But here's the beautiful message of the Bible, is that God has shown us in the sending of his son, in his incarnation, it is proof to you that God wanted to enter into a relationship with his people, with his creation, that he wanted to enter into a relationship with you, And so I'm going to ask you, what kind of relationship do you have with him? How do you approach him? How do you look at him? Because God's mission is all about people. And when you study what Jesus did as he lived here, he didn't come to build a school or develop a company. He came to rescue fallen creation. And he came to rescue people. And he met them on the street corners. As the beggars would be sitting there calling out for money or alms or any kind of type of aid, and Jesus would stop. He would allow himself to be disrupted by their need. And he would touch them, he would speak to them, he would heal them, he would restore them. And these are the stories that we see that remind us that God wants a relationship with people, with his creation. He wants a relationship with you. So what kind of relationship do you have with him? So the very first story we're going to look at today is the story of a paralyzed man. I'd love for you to turn to Mark chapter 2 in this passage, and we're going to be looking mostly through Mark, and we'll have a few other passages outside of Mark, but in Mark chapter 2, it tells the story about a paralyzed man and some of his buddies. So listen to the story. It goes like this in verse 1 of chapter 2. And when he had returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. 
and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof from above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things within your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, and take your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and he went out before them all. So they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this ever before. What an encounter. What a story. When Jesus was living in the region of Galilee, we hear people from all over the land had heard. These people were telling from one town to the next what was happening with this man from Nazareth. And people as far away as Jerusalem made a journey to the region of Galilee and came and swarmed the area. They wanted to see, they wanted to hear, they wanted to be healed because this was no ordinary man. They had seen many people who had come and gone, but no one was able to do what he was able to do. And the story spread and crowds swarmed the region. There were so many times that he would have to go and escape the large crowds as they would follow him around the lake, the Sea of Galilee. He'd have to go off in the middle of the night to get rest because there were so many people that were there. We hear that he would go up to the mountain to pray because of the the taxing life that he was having with meeting all the needs of these people. And here... When he comes back from a journey, he comes back to his hometown, he comes back to housing that he has. It says his home. And Jesus would open up his home, and he invited people to come in. And there were so many people in his house that day that there was no room even to get through the door. People were spilling out into the streets because the houses there were right on the edge of the street and there were so many of them. There was no way you could even get through the doorway. They were, you can imagine this, this kind of mud hut that was built there. Probably had some windows, so people were probably hanging out by the windowsill listening to Jesus preach the word to the people that were inside. They got there too late and here four men bring their friend. Oh, would they wish... Their friend could just be touched by Jesus, that Jesus would just take notice of him, and maybe he could be healed. So, as the crowd was listening to Jesus preach, these four guys came late to the party, and they don't know how to get in, but they were so determined they would not allow any barrier to keep them from Jesus. Now, there's something we learn right in the beginning of the story about how you and I should approach Jesus. What kind of barriers have you set up to keep you from Jesus? Maybe it's your own philosophy. You don't believe in God. There's no way this kind of God exists. We can't see him. There's no evidence of him. There's no scientific proof that he exists. I can't do any kind of project to make appear before you? And so what kind of barrier have you set up in your life that keeps you from Jesus? 
Well, these four men were not going to allow any barrier to keep him away. And there's the right kind of response that you and I should have if we're trying to find out who this Jesus is. We should strive to find him, to seek him, to know him. That's the right approach that we should have. And Jesus is preaching the word to them. And he spoke about the Old Testament and how the Old Testament prophets and priests and the stories of the Old Testament pointed to him and made everyone aware that he was now the one that they had been promised. He was the Messiah. He would be the redeemer. He would be the rescuer. And they heard these stories. They heard him proclaim the truth from there. Do you remember what the Apostle Paul said about Jesus? He said this, looking at Jesus allows us to better understand the invisible God. That's what he said in Colossians 1, verse 15 and 16. Listen to these beautiful verses that Paul says. He is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to see God, if you want to know God, if you want to understand God, all you have to do is look to Jesus. Because that's who he is. That's what Paul understood. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And that includes you. You were created for him. He is your maker. And the paralytic's friends were so eager to get him into the presence of Jesus. In those days... They had flat roofs on the top of the home. And you would have an external staircase that takes you up to the roof. It would be sort of like your deck that you might go out to in your backyard. You went to the rooftops in the ancient Near East. And what they would do at the top of the house, they would lay wood beams across from wall to wall. And then in between those beams, they would fill it with reeds and thatch. And then they would pack mud and clay onto it. And then the sun would bake it so hard that it would have a hard surface. And often grass would grow on the top of that. So you can understand what would happen. As they got to the rooftop, they begin digging through the clay and the mud and through the thatch. And they open up. And you can imagine how they disrupted Jesus' perfect sermon. Can you think about what was happening if you were inside the house and you're hearing, you start to see the clay and the debris starting to fall from the ceiling? Can you imagine what Jesus was thinking in the middle of it? He wasn't angry. He wasn't disruptive. He commends them for what they do to the extent that they would bring their friend who had a great need of healing and restoration that they would do everything necessary. And they open up the floor, and you can imagine looking down, and they see Jesus, he's looking back up to them, and they begin to lower the man down on his mat before them. So what's Jesus going to do? All the people in the room, all the people that were standing at the windows, what on earth is Jesus going to do with this? And Jesus allow this disruption to happen because that's what he always does. There's never a disruption for Jesus. And so how do you approach him? How do you see yourself in this story? You see, if we knew that there was a treasure buried on a plot of land that you had the opportunity to buy, I think all of us would go and Get the money and purchase that land to be able to unearth the treasure. Well, the scriptures are going to tell you that that's exactly what Jesus is to the world. He is the treasure that we should seek and do everything possible to receive it, to get it, to have it. And that's exactly what these four men were doing for their buddy. But the motivation for why they came to Jesus was all wrong. And that's what we're going to explore a little bit right now. Because that can be what we do with our response to Jesus and our approach to him. We can have the wrong motivation because what they wanted was the cure for this young man. Now think about being a person with disability in the ancient Near East. And it still happens in third world countries that if you have a disease... You're ostracized. You're cut off from 
your family. You're left destitute. You might be put away by others. You lose your friends. You don't have the opportunity to have the the relationships that you and I have experienced. We had a ministry in one of the churches I served in and sending wheelchairs to different parts of the world where there's very little care for those that have disabilities. And so many families that don't have what they need to be able to take care of their children and so many of those families give up their children. And that's what he experienced all of his life. Here he is laying on a mat, maybe put out each day, carried by his four friends to sit on the street side to ask for people to give him money to give him food, to give him aid. And that was his daily existence. And his four buddies wanted something better for him. They they thought the cure was exactly what he needed. If he could be cured, then his life would return to normal. It would be more like their life. And that's what they wanted for him. It It was a good ambition but the wrong motivation for going to Jesus because they didn't come to Jesus because they loved him. They came to Jesus because they wanted something from him. They wanted to use Jesus for what they needed. And I think many of us approach the same way to Jesus. That we come to him for this very same purpose. We seek him out because we have need of him. When we don't have need of him, we forget him. And our approach can be so easy like these. They wanted healing more than they wanted Jesus. They wanted a cure more than they wanted the relationship that Jesus wanted with them and what Jesus wants with you. So how do you approach Jesus? How do you look to him? Are you looking to him as a person who will meet your needs? Or do you come to him as a savior so that you see him as a savior and your redeemer, what you'd most desperately need in your life? They thought their friend needed a cure to heal him so he won't be ostracized. But the problem was that they were resting on their own righteousness. They didn't see the need for Jesus for them and for him. All they wanted was the cure. And so Jesus' response when he's lowered down in front of him, the words out of his mouth is, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now his four buddies are still back on the roof watching what's going on as they lowered him down to Jesus' eyesight. And they heard what he said, but you can imagine what they were thinking. We didn't ask for forgiveness. We wanted a cure. They didn't get what they wanted. But Jesus gave them what he needed. See, our greatest problem is our own self-righteousness. And that's the problem that we have. And what we needed most was not a cure for our ailments, but the cure for our sin-sick heart. Now, many of you might be sitting here and think, well, I don't have a sin-sick heart. My heart isn't that bad. Because you've underestimated your sinfulness and you've overestimated who you are. And that's the kind of response many have to Jesus. My sin isn't that bad. I'm not in that much of a need. There's no need for Jesus to have mounted a cross for me. I'm I'm pretty good. So let's look at this self-righteousness problem for a moment. Let's consider what it says. You think that you can do something to win God's favor. You think by some of the activity that you might do, a little bit more, a little more goodness in my life, a little more given in the tithes and offerings when they take it up at the church, a little more effort, all of these things will do the trick. And we live our life hoping that all the good that we do over the lifetime will outweigh all the bad things that have been done by us over a lifetime. That's how most people live their life. They hope that the scales will be tipped in their favor in the end. And they strive to do more and more good and hope that they would be able to win God's favor. 
here's the problem with that. The Bible makes it very clear that there's nothing you and I can do to make ourselves right before God. That's what the Bible is saying from the beginning to the end. Our condition is our self-righteousness and there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. That's the story of the Bible. That's the gospel message that you need to hear. That your sinfulness is so large that there's nothing you can do to blot it out by yourself. And the beautiful message of the gospel is that God didn't leave us in that condition, that he would send his son to come and to do what we needed done in order for that enormous blot of sin in our life to be no longer counting against us. But our self-righteousness is our biggest problem. So let's look at it a little bit more. You see, we believe that better behavior wins God's favor. There's a little slogan for you. Better behavior wins God's favor. Well, that's absolutely wrong. You see, that's salvation measured by your self-righteousness. What you're able to do and what you're able to accomplish, the little more that you might have to add, all of these things that we do. So how is your approach to God? Is that like yours? Is that how you go about your daily activity? Is it, Lord, I, need to, I know I need to be here in church on Sunday morning. I'll, I'll come this week. I'll do a little bit more. But that's the wrong motive. You're putting your trust in yourself instead of leaning on what Jesus Christ has done for you and what he has accomplished on your behalf. And you've overestimated yourself and underestimated your sin. Let's think about this for a moment. Look at how easy it is for us to blame other people for the temptation and sin in our life. Oh, just drive your car a little while, and it's all the other people that are driving their cars to their problem, not me. Oh, the impatience that you might have in line at a grocery store or maybe at a sporting event, it's everybody else that's the problem. It's not your impatience that we have to look at. You see, that's what we start to do. We look at everybody else around us and we compare ourselves to them. Look, I'm not as bad as that person. Look at what they've done. At least I go to church on Sunday. They don't. You see, this is what self-righteousness does. It puffs us up. It looks at ourselves and elevates us to a degree that we can't even see our own sin. Oh, you remember the Old Testament story about King David, don't you? The man who committed adultery with another man's wife and then murdered her husband. Do you remember that story in the Old Testament? We studied that a few years ago, the life of David. And do you remember, he wasn't able to even see that his sin was a problem. And yet he was a king representing God to the people of Israel and Israel to the people, to God. And here he was in that kind of relationship, a mediator in a sense between God and man. And he wasn't able to see that he was violating what God had designed for him in his life. He was spiritually blind to it. And it took a person who had to come before him and point it out to him and point his sin to him because David couldn't see it. And that's the problem with you and me. We can't often see how sinful we truly are because we've allowed pride, we've allowed arrogance, we've allowed self-righteousness to blind our sight to our sinfulness. David's pride made him think that he was untouchable as a king of Israel. David's arrogance made him think that he was better than all the people around him. And David's lust for power blinded him for, to God's design for his life and for your life and mine. And so how do you approach Jesus? How do you look at him? Are you resting on your own self-righteousness or will you see the need for the righteousness of another in Jesus Christ. Well, here's the good news of the gospel. Let's look back at the story for a moment. 
The guy's laid down before him. He's lowered by ropes. And the words are, by Jesus, son, your sins are forgiven. There he offers the free grace of the gospel to a paralytic who didn't even know he needed it. And you see, that's what God will do for you and me. He offers you grace. He offers you exactly what you need. Because the greatest need, the greatest need for that man, the greatest need for you and me is the rescue from our own self-righteousness. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that you may believe in him and have eternal life through him. Warren Wearsby said this, forgiveness is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performs. It meets the greatest need, it, it costs the greatest price, and it brings the greatest blessing and the most lasting results. Isn't that true? This is what you and I need. As broken, sinful people, this is what this story is used by Mark to do in you and me in the life of the paralytic and his four friends and everyone sitting in the crowded room that night. This is what he wants you to hear, that you need Jesus. And how you approach him is vital. Will you use him? Or will you receive him? But then the story goes on to tell you a little more about the response that some of the people had in the crowd. The religious leaders, the people who were experts in the law, they knew all the Old Testament. Jesus had just been preaching about the beautiful words from the Old Testament that pointed to him. They knew it, but they didn't believe he was the one. And they called him a blasphemer. Because it was punishable by death if you claimed to be God as a human. You'd be taken out in the streets and stoned in the ancient Near East in that day. And they brought a charge against Jesus. They showed their hatred and their rejection of him. But Jesus wanted them to see their problem, their self-righteousness. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus starts it off with this very verse, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you know what he meant by that? Remember, we studied the Beatitudes. What Jesus was telling the crowd on that mountain that day, and probably in the crowd that was sitting in his house in that time, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that understand that they're spiritually bankrupt. Because that's the best position you can be in because it shows you you need a savior. And that's you in the Bible. Each and every one of us sitting here in this room are spiritually bankrupt. And the only one who can help us is God's son, the one sitting in that room that day. And the paralytic was looking for the wrong kind of cure. But Jesus, out of grace and mercy, showed him grace and gave him exactly what he needed. But the religious leaders that day, they didn't see that they were spiritually bankrupt. They thought they were spiritually awesome and better than the people sitting in the room all around them. They were the experts. They were the ones that everybody would come to to find out how to live their life according to the way, and because Jesus wasn't going to go and live according to their ways, they were opposed to him. So it says in verse 6, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, they're right with that last statement. Who can forgive sins except God alone? You can't find a solution for your own sin. You have to turn to God. That's what the Bible is saying over and over again. When Jesus offers forgiveness of sins, he's declaring that he's the very son of God. He was proclaiming to everyone in that room that he was the one sent down out of heaven. The bread of heaven had come down to be a sacrifice for his people. 
So Jesus said, and immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that thus that they questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things within your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. So he asked the question, what's easier to do? Is it to forgive sins or is it to heal the person there? Well, if he says it's going to be forgiveness of sins, you can't verify that that actually happened in the paralytic, can you? You wouldn't have evidence to be able to prove that that would be there. So what is easier to say that you're healed? Because then everybody in the room would know instantly if he was telling the truth or not. And so what does Jesus do? He goes and he heals the man. And everyone in the room was able to see the man get up from his mat and walk out. And never have to deal with that illness again. But he said, I'm doing this so that you would see that I have authority from heaven. And I have come down out of heaven to be the son of man that would do what was right and necessary for mankind to be made right with God. That's what he's declaring in that room that day. And to that paralytic. To show that the son of man a title that was used of God in the book of Daniel, and they all knew, the scribes that were sitting there knew what that name meant, and they knew exactly what he was saying, and what was the response? They were angry, and they rejected, and they plotted to kill him, and eventually did so. But in chapter 2 of Mark, Mark wants you to understand who this Jesus is. He's the son of man who has come to take away the sins of the world and give his life as a ransom for many. That's what you hear all throughout the Gospel of Mark. And J.C. Ryle, a famous Anglican preacher, said, this is the thing that none can do but God, no angel in heaven, no man upon earth, no church in council, no minister of any denomination can take away from the sinner's conscience the load of guilt and give him peace with God. Only Jesus can do that. What's amazing? We have someone we can turn to to be our help. Just as the paralytic said, somebody to drop before him. We're not left on our own. God loves this world so much that he would send his son to a city in Capernaum to a little house that day so that people would hear the good news that he brought. And he would go to the cross and allow his body to be immobilized so that you and I could have the right cure for our greatest need. You see, we needed to be rescued from ourselves and Jesus came and did it. And this is the encounter the paralytic and all the people that witnessed had that day. So how do you respond to him? Will you come to him and use him like the paralytic was trying to do? Will you, if you don't know him, continue to reject him and have hatred in your heart toward him and say, I don't want anything to do. I want to live my life the way I want to live it. Or will you respond in receiving him and trusting in him, and living your life for him, and surrendering your life into his, and know that he will give you life more abundant than you could ever imagine. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that gives us this encounter today. It shows us the beautiful work that you have done for us. Lord, would you help us today to see how we approach you? Would you use your spirit to reveal to our hearts what is truly there and what we do when we come to you? Lord, maybe we have the wrong motivation. Maybe we have the wrong philosophy. 
So Lord, would you open our eyes to be able to see these things and to see the meaning of this story for our life today. And would you open their eyes to be able to see the beauty of your grace and what Jesus has done for them? And would they be able to come to you and find the greatest cure for their greatest need? Thank you for giving us Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, we come to you humble and lowly. We come to you knowing you're only. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling, come and trade Trade your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling, come Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. Oh, come, oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Oh, what a say. No, sing no. 
these stories or encounters that people had with Jesus cause us to consider our encounter with him. Do we know him? Do we know him the right way? Have we approached him with the right motivation in our heart? Do we come because we need him? And that we put our trust in him and for our salvation and for our life eternally? That's what he desires of us. He made us for a purpose to be in relationship with him. And so today I hope you've heard the good news that he can be found, that he can be received into your life. That he, just as he said to that paralytic, said, son, your sins are forgiven. And that is the greatest gift that God could accomplish for us, the greatest miracle God has done and achieved for us in the death of his son to provide us for forgiveness. May you turn to him and walk in his ways. May you use this day to hear the glory of God's grace and mercy. And may you walk today with God's power behind you and in you and working through you in this world for his kingdom's sake. Now would you go God's blessing. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore. Well, God bless and see you next week. Come and listen to another encounter that Jesus had with some people. See you then. God bless.